You're listening to the 95 Podcast from the team at 95 Network, where we host conversations specifically designed to support leaders in small and mid-sized churches. Welcome back to the 95 Podcast. I'm Dale Sellers, Executive Director at 95 Network, and um, just very thankful for what God's doing in the new year. A lot of cool things are happening. One of the cool things for us is is that we have about a dozen conferences uh, between January and uh, May that we are doing in our Soul Care Essentials Arena. And I'm very thankful that uh, that so many people have um, stepped up and hosted the conferences, but also just for the impact that the conferences are having. It's it's just really cool. Uh, today, I have a really special guest that I've never met before. <laughs> so, in fact, sometimes people ask me, say, "How do you get these people on your podcast?" I go, "I ask them." <laughs> and so today. Uh, I was looking on Facebook uh, recently, and I don't, I guess we must have a mutual friend, but Matt Adair, who is from uh, the Athens, Georgia area, had posted something about discipleship, and I thought, oh my goodness, that is so right on. And so I just I just messaged you and said, hey, Matt, can we talk? And, and, and as we talked, I thought, man, I would love to have him on our podcast because I think discipleship is something... Uh, I, I think it's, I don't think it's too, uh, too extreme to say, I think we flounder in this arena horribly in the church world, which, it, and it should be something we do very well. And so I consider Matt to be an expert after talking to him for a while. And so I thought, well, if I know, I've, I've met an expert, we need to have the expert on. So today, Matt Adair uh, from Georgia, Matt, uh, thank you for joining me today, man. Hey, Dale. So good to see you, man. Well, it's just good to have an expert with me today that can, you know, once we get through, everybody will know how to do discipleship perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> we have set a low bar to clear, so let's see what happens. <laughs> well, uh, as I always like to do, I would love for people to get to know your story. So if you would just yeah. take a few moments and kind of tell us uh, who you're, what your story is, then we'll kind of dive into some specifics about the topic today. Yeah, I um, I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, my dad was there in, in the Air Force, so okay. moved around some. All right, so Texas. before you go any further, I got to ask you, so yeah. you live in Georgia, but you were born in yeah. Alabama. Which team? Yeah. Uh, so I'm a fan of the Alabama Crimson Tide okay. and have lived in the Athens, Georgia area since 2004. So uh, um, it's an interesting place to live. Uh, and to live um, without shame as an Alabama fan. So you're still an Alabama uh, fan in Athens. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So the way that I explain this, um, so uh, Alabama and Georgia have, uh, we have common enemies and they all happen we're, to we're be teams that are in orange. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's Tennessee, it's Auburn, it's Florida, it's Clemson. It's, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. And, so, you know, we, we're cousins, um, but we don't always see it that way. And cousins don't always get along. There's and so, so many a, places I want to go right now, but it would not be appropriate for my body. Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, decade <laughs> and uh, lots of life lessons and uh, things of that nature. But yeah, so uh, born in Birmingham, moved around, um, went to high school in West Texas, Friday Night Lights, the book and the movie. Uh, we played those guys and uh moved back to Birmingham for both undergraduate and graduate school and then um God called me into vocational ministry and um we moved here to the Athens area in 2004 to help replant a church and was a lead pastor here for 17 years before I joined the staff at Fellowship Bible Church in the Atlanta area last year to be their pastor for transformational discipleship which was both a vocational transition and really um, also just, I think, an opportunity for me to step into what really has become uh, sort of uh, an obsession for me, which is how do we as churches help make disciples of Jesus? And um, and so uh, I get to do it uh, all the time. Uh, I, I get to spend pretty much all of my vocational life um, helping one church uh, in the Atlanta area make disciples, but also helping more and more churches do that too, through what we're doing with transformational discipleship, which is a brand new initiative that we've started. So yeah, man, I, I think about it a lot, um, a practitioner. And so I'm really happy that we are here talking about it today. 
Well, I'm just going to be really honest. I pastored for 12 years, uh, a, a small church in this, in South Carolina. And I, you know, I, I don't think we did a, a great job of doing discipleship the way it is done traditionally. Mm. But I do think uh, now that I look back, because that was a long time ago, we must have done some things pretty well because there's a lot of people who continue to reach out to us that are connected to us. Um, uh, just recently we had a, a podcast. We had a young man named Jeff Wright who was on and, and Jeff came to our church when, when he was eight years old, uh, mm -hmm. his parents had split up and, and, and I, and he loved the outdoors. So I, I, I just, I, I took him hunting with me and, and then, uh, over time he, you know, they left our, our, the church actually closed. And so, Jeff lost his way really, you know, really mm -hmm. went, but, but he now is a missionary in a foreign country. And, and, and mm -hmm. I, and I told him, I said, you know, that, that is discipleship because I, I took, I, I modeled real life for him. And I think, uh, and, and this is one of the things I wanted you to kind of dive into to start with discipleship was never supposed to be just intellectual. Was it? No. Is um, it more relational mentoring kind of thing? Tell us what biblical discipleship really should be. Well, I, I think let's start with uh, what I think uh, is the most clear outcome of discipleship. And and I, I spend a lot of time wondering if we somehow haven't lost this thread. When I think about Jesus, um, when, when he is asked, so in the end, what's the greatest of these commandments, 613 laws that are embedded in Torah? And Jesus, of course, said he came not to throw those away, but to fulfill them and, mm -hmm. and really, you know, let me explain it. And what does he say? Well, it comes down to loving God with every fiber of your being. And the way that we do that primarily is by loving our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. And who is our neighbor? Well, that's an interesting question that Jesus gets into. But I, I've been curious for a long time that in Matthew's volume of the Gospel Collection, here's Jesus in this collection of sayings that we call the Sermon on the Mount that really shows his sort of manifesto. What does it look like to live in light of the wisdom that God's given us in the Torah and these laws? He says, you know, you've heard it said that you should love your neighbor. Yeah. I tell you that in the end, we love our enemies. And at the heart and soul of Jesus' way in life, and I think this is the real outcome that we're after, is there's a lifelong transformational process that Jesus, through his spirit, does in the life of his disciples. That you uh, you come to a point where a person can't even conceive, can't even think of, can't even fathom anything other than loving their enemies. Mm. That's a pretty big life change. When we talk about life change in church, I'm always curious about what we mean, but yes. that's what I think Jesus means in terms of life change. And it isn't quick, even though there are sudden changes in our life that Jesus does in different stages and seasons. But when when I think about discipleship, I hope that what I'm banging the drum for is recovering what Jesus is after, and that is discipleship in a church should lead to a community of people who are growing in their capacity to love their enemies. Mm. And mm. I don't see that in a no, lot of churches. It, it isn't, isn't it the goal of most churches? Or let me say it this way. Hasn't it been the goal of most churches, or at least in my opinion, I'm, I, I, I always generalize, um, to basically create a, a social club to attract people just like us, or either if we attract people to make them like us. Isn't that kind of been what the focal point has been? Well, I, I think when, and this isn't original with me, but I was really helped when somebody described traditional discipleship. And I think what they're really referring to is, let's say, the past 50 to 100 years of yeah. discipleship in the American church, yeah. that it's really built on the ABCs of academics, behavior, and church activity. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm always curious about what we expected the ABCs to pr produce, and so that's why I think it's so important for us to come back and go, well, what should we expect to happen through our efforts to make disciples? And while I think it's important for us to develop cognition and for people to grow uh, through information into wisdom, and while we want to live in such a way that we are distinct from the world around us, and while we do see church activities as being helpful in the cultivation of a kind of life, Without a clear outcome that we're pursuing, 
I, I think we just kind of maybe sometimes can miss the thread. And again, I always say I'm not working with, uh, I'm not talking to your church. Um, I'm talking to uh, all churches mm-hmm. and going, now what about you? Um, so I don't want to assume that that churches aren't pursuing that end of love and loving your enemies. Um, but that's the conversation. That's where I always like to take it to. And so then it becomes, what does it take for us to see uh, communities of disciples formed that look like that? And that's really, I think, the work of transformational discipleship. Wouldn't a church <laughs> that learned how to love its enemies and uh, look past the things we disagree upon uh, and love people, wouldn't that be very, uh, and I hate to use this word, attractional in our in our society today? <laughs> I think so. I mean, I, I think about uh, the church that I have the opportunity to serve right now. Um, you know, I went from 17 years of, of, uh, of pastoring a small to mid-sized church and now our church is a little bit larger, and it's it's an intercultural, distinctly, intentionally intercultural, intergenerational church. And here in Georgia, we um, you know we have been in a, a season that uh, finished up with a senatorial runoff between uh, two men. There, there's no uh, there's no politics down there. <laughs> no, and so uh, when I when I said in a sermon uh, back in October that in this church, in this community, in the name of Jesus, you have people who are going to vote for Herschel Walker, and in the name of Jesus, you have people who are going to vote for Raphael Warnock. So that, when you have that, and and not only have differences, but people who love in the midst of differences, Mm -hmm. because we're not saying set aside the differences and the distinctions and the perspectives, we're saying as we hold our own convictions in the name of Jesus, let's just keep those there. And we love each other well. We I mean, talk about what it looks like to love, right? And but when we do that, yes, I do think that's attractive in a world where nobody can seem to get along, where we cancel each other out for the smallest of differences. Yes. So when you see a community of people who are covenantally committed, it isn't just I'm here until you you cross a line. You're like, no, I'm going to be here even when you do. Yeah, that's a very very powerful statement. And I think that now you're starting to talk about cities on a hill and things like that. that. That's what's always curious to me, Dale, is I'm not sure what we expect the the, the distinction to be that will actually be uh, that light on the city in a hill. I think it's love. I, I think it's the kind of love that's so radical that we have the willingness and the ability to love uh, our enemies. That would be an amazing thing to see I, in our world. I grew up in a, uh, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, but most of my family members were in a more fundamentalist atmosphere. And and it seems like the goal of back then was to get away from the world, be ye separate, be ye holy. That, I heard that stuff. And so you don't intermingle. And I had aunts and uncles who wouldn't go to restaurants that served alcohol, you know, because right. oh, it, it, it seemed like that, it, that pendulum uh, never swung back the other way, which is what right. we're talking about today, you know, because uh, just because we disagree doesn't mean we can't be friends. <laughs> You know, right. And and the church, the church knows how to do this. I I think there's so much when you, when you see the way of Jesus break out in the book of Acts, and when you see the apostle Paul and others in the epistles trying to work this out, the two things that I think are always interesting is there's, there's always the working out of distinctiveness um, while they're in the world that they live in. Yes. And so it is, you know, what does it mean to be a holy people, a set apart people, a distinct people in the world that you're living in? The distinction ultimately is a distinction that is shaped by love. And I think that that puts particular contours in the way we relate to other people while we remain distinct from them. And so that's always lived in tension. I think that's why uh, that's why Paul was having to write these letters to churches is because it isn't simplistic. It's complicated. It requires wisdom. It requires discernment. But I also think that it requires us to embrace a life that values belonging more than exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a real different path for us that I think is a challenge for us in our day. I think that we want to make sure that we have drawn clear lines and we have established and erected the appropriate uh, boundaries to keep us from being in the world. And it isn't that we don't have distinctions. We do. 
But how do we create a space where anybody can come into contact with anyone in our church and feel like they belong? Wow. I just that remember, they're welcome. I just remember I, what I felt like as a kid growing up was that we were scared. Here, here's what it felt like. It felt like we were scared that if we went in those arenas and, and, and were uh, unguarded, that maybe we would fall back into something. Yeah, I'm, that, I'm working yeah. on this because does that make it, sense it, to you? Seemed, it does. I mean, I, I think there's a there's a, a number of things as people think about the political landscape we live in or even the historic uh, ecclesiastical landscape in America over the last hundred years. And there's a common theme of fear. And I, I've been sitting with this, Dale, and I'm interested in what you what you think about this. Um, it, you know, again, I, I, I hear the scriptures talk about perfect love casting out fear and I wonder when we, when our life individually as Christians or together as the church is animated by fear, I I think we may have lost the thread. And so I <laughs> I I think I, I go all the way back to the garden in Genesis one to three, and and I see this distinction between wisdom and foolishness. Wisdom receiving the gifts that God gives us, mm -hmm. foolishness taking matters into our own hands, and I think fear leads us to foolishness. I, I think we step away from the wisdom that God gives us and how we treat one another and treat the world around us. And I think we try to make things happen. I think we try to keep ourselves safe um, by being fueled by fear. And so to me, when I see and hear fear animate people on whatever perspective they have about the world around them, uh, that, 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 that makes me wonder if we haven't just lost God's wisdom. It, it, oh, I'm so glad you're going here. I, I've not had this conversation with anyone on the podcast. So, so what I see, and I've been, again, I've been doing ministry for 40 years and I've been in l thousands of churches through uh, the experience. And, and and it seems that most churches I go to, their people are consumed with fear. It, it, yes. And it could be from a religious perspective or a, a woe is me perspective. I remember, right. and, I, and I'm an old man, but in, in 1988, this book came out, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. Well, like, we had a music <laughs> group on the, we had a music group on the road back then. And we would go to churches and we would meet people who had been in the church for 20, 30, 40, 50 years who are petrified. Yeah. That Jesus may come back in 88. Now, he right. didn't come in 88, so the guy wrote a follow-up and said he's coming in 89. And both, both times he missed it. <laughs> Added one more reason. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but he made a lot of money. The thing about yes, it that blew my mind was is people were scared Jesus was going to come back. And then I want to go. I want to yeah. even go a little deeper with this. Uh, it seems that most, I can't, most is the wrong word to use. A, a, yeah. a, a lot of people I've experienced, a lot of churches are almost scared of the Holy Spirit which is the third mm. person of the Trinity and which hurts right. them because it all goes back to this, this key verse, second Timothy one, seven, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. He's given us one right. of power, love and a sound mind. So if God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, yeah. there's only one of the source for that. But yet the church yeah. doesn't even know that uh, the, it appears. It doesn't even know it needs to deal with that. Yeah, and I think there, are, it's 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 a complex set of reasons why I think and feel um, that we've arrived there. And um, I think when you look at the church as a system, um, either a localized system of individuals or uh, sort of a, a larger um, regional, national, international network of these communities. It does seem that fear and anxiety has gripped us and has really shaped um, how we live. It's shaped how we think. It's shaped how we feel. And it's caused us to be rather reactive rather than proactive. And I think that's an aspect of what uh, Paul's writing in Timothy is there's an aspect in which we're working with God proactively mm -hmm. rather than simply uh, reacting to the world around us. Uh, and maybe missing what Jesus intends for us to be and do um, towards one another and towards the world around us. I think even some pastors lay, lead by fear. And mm. I think they do yeah. that because they don't know how to lead. Isn't the objective of discipleship to train up people to release them? Isn't it the calling, according to Ephesians 4, of the pastor, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher, to equip saints to do ministry? But yet it seems like in the, at least the American model, our goal is to, to try to draw as many people around us as possible. Isn't that counter to discipleship? 
Uh, I, I think it, uh, they live in tension with one another. I think there's always a gathering and scattering principle. Um, mm -hmm. I think we need these relational environments. I think it's important for us to have these sort of big public spaces of 100 people or more, or even sort of uh, social spaces of 25 to 75 people where you do have a lot of people around one another. And there are ways in which I think Jesus and his spirit works within that to yep. to to make disciples. But there's always questions underneath it is what's the purpose and cause of this. And um, if there is that sense of y'all come here, the wise man yeah. tell you how things go. And let me tell you, I'm glad you're in here today because you know, it's real scary out there and you can't mm -hmm. trust people out there. Matter of fact, I'm not sure you can trust anyone other than me. <laughs> <laughs> no one says that, but they have certainly lived that way. <laughs> well, I think you can see it sometimes. You just see, you just get, you just get those type of things. And yes. so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's worth questioning to me. I think where I have a lot of empathy for leaders and sympathy for a lot of people who think of discipleship in traditional ways it's the fact that uh, it's somewhere along the way, somebody passed this down to us. Discipleship yes. happens. Yes. D you know, discipleship happens, whether it's intentional or not. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Everybody's being formed and shaped and transformed mm -hmm. by someone or something else. And so what I find is I'm working with churches and in the churches that I've been a part of leading is that uh, a lot of people are living out what somebody they trusted told them and trained them in terms of how to think, how to feel, how to live. And um, and so I think that that's so much of it. It, it. But it just comes back to me is it's why I always ask the question, to what purpose? Yes. What are we here for? When we talk about making disciples, what should that look like? And what does it take to get there? And what I find is that uh, discipleship's a little bit like the the Griswold family turkey and Christmas vacation. Uh, it looks good, and then you cut it open, and then just the whole thing just it just explodes, and there's nothing there. And and I don't mean that antagonistically, no, no. Um, but it, it there is a sense of I really believe that Jesus has given us uh, all that we need to recalibrate and to to really see discipleship transformed so that we can see the lives of people in our church and the world around us transformed. Well, the purpose of having this conversation and going where we've been going and trying to be honest is 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 it, it, it the pandemic and and the resulting um uh, consequences of the pandemic have clearly revealed to us there was something broken in the church before the right. pandemic, which we, yeah. those of us who do this knew, knew that we at 95 network, we've been trying for years to help churches make adjustments and change, but the pandemic forced it. And so when yeah. the pandemic quote unquote, when things begin to loosen back up, I, I, even as we record this, I'm not sure I will say we're post pandemic, right. but everything else, everything in society came back bigger and better and fuller than ever. You know, all the sporting things, concerts, every, but the church did not. And the, and the right. number we consistently hear is that 30%, no matter what size your church was, of your key people just never came back. Right. And some of those were motivated by fear that we talked about earlier. But I think sometimes it's just because they're like, you know what? I've been out of church for two years and my life hasn't changed at all. Right. That shouldn't be the case. So, it shouldn't. So as you, as you clearly de described some of the out, outflows of discipleship, kind of define for us what would really good discipleship look like if, if, if there's a way to do that. I, I know that it's broad because we have different parts of the country, different denominations, the whole deal. But what's the objective of real biblical discipleship? Well, the the way that I try to describe it that I think will capture, I think, both the heart and the vision and the values of most churches is that I I believe that discipleship, and I'm going to put the modifier on it, transformational discipleship, okay. because I just think at this point, we can't assume that discipleship is intended to be transformational. So transformational discipleship is a lifelong process of a person becoming like Jesus for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it's important to see that it's a lifelong process. When we talk about loving your enemies, um, what I would hope and see and expect is that someone, uh, I'm 46, I would hope that somebody who's uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years older than me, that I'm seeing them better able and more willing to love their enemies than I am. And I think I'm probably further along, thankfully, than I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. 
So it's a lifelong process, that idea of becoming like Jesus. And if we want to double click on that, I mean, loving your enemies. I would say that if you want to go, what does it look like to, to be like Jesus? Love your enemies. Because I think that that's so radical. And I think that that's how Jesus walked the earth. And I think that that really explains a lot about what he's doing on the cross. Um, when we have a people who look like that for the sake of other people, all the things that we think of under that big umbrella of mission, from global missions to evangelism, to mercy, to justice, to just people's ordinary vocations day in and day out. When you see people who are becoming like Jesus, um, that to me is what we talk about discipleship. So when we talk about what are, when Jesus says, make disciples, I think he is wanting and inviting us to not only be transformed ourselves, but to do the work together in community of we're all helping each other become like Jesus. We're all helping each other grow in our capacity to love our neighbor. And in doing that, that's going to lead to the outflow of us walking out of our church buildings and out of our church communities, wherever they might meet, and to loving the people around us in such a way that they see Jesus in us. That's how I think of discipleship. So Matt, when Jesus was talking uh, and talking about loving your enemies, a, a lot of that was the Romans who they were, you know, enslaved to in a sense, you know, at least under their jurisdiction. Right. Define what enemies would be in in the United States today. Because well, I, I, think... I know the first thing I thought is, okay, well, well do we really have enemies or do we just yeah. have people who disagree with us politically or or something like that? Define well, that. I think about I think about even um, I, I do think that that, you know, historically and contextually, I mean, when Jesus is saying this on the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you got a large crowd of people and you probably do have uh, some Roman soldiers wondering what's going on here. And so I do think that that would be the natural uh, way that uh, the Jewish people collectively. But again, I think in terms of Matthew's volume of the gospel collection, you know, Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience trying to convince the vulnerable among the Jews that there are no outsiders. Mm -hmm. So to uh, to the Jews, uh, just even internally, uh, you had insiders who looked at outsiders as their enemies because some of them, particularly in the way that they lived, they were creating the problems. This is why the people still felt like they were in exile. Yeah. And if you're an outsider, if you're among the vulnerable and the marginalized um, in that society, then you would have maybe looked at the insiders as those who continue to maintain this distance from you and make your life more difficult for some of that. I think about Paul's letter to the Romans, which I really believe is is less about um, him trying to explain a justification by faith. And I think he's trying to help this uh, this church made up of Jewish and non-Jewish people try to get along. And how do you love one another? And when he gets into the back half of that, and he's trying to say, hey, look, I'll do one another in honor. That's loving your enemy. Why? Because sometimes, even in my own house, amongst my children mm -hmm. and with my spouse, there are moments in which we feel the impulse of enemy. We feel the impulse of we're not here to get along. So I think that there are big macro ways that we can think about it in the world that we live in. But I think it also becomes very interpersonal. Yeah. If you're in relationship with anyone long enough and for any depth, you're going to have that sense of enemy. Okay, now here and now in this moment, when we're not getting along, how do I love you? Well, and then there are some people that just positionally um, and almost categorically we would look at as enemy. And so if I was to think of it biblically and theologically, well, what is God after in the world? Uh, God's always after the work of love and justice. And so anyone and, and, and anything that stands in the way of love and justice that we would just, we would start there and say that those are the enemies of God. And as his apprentices, as his disciples, it's probably what we look at there. So uh, that at least gives us some categories to work out of. I could talk to you for eight hours. <laughs> but let me do this. I want to take a short break. And then yeah. when we come back, I've got a, 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 an observation that I want to dive into. So we're we'll taking a short break. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back here with Matt Adair and uh, Matt. So I, here, here's my observation. When, when Jesus, the night before he goes to the cross, he prays the prayer in John. And, you know, and, and at some point the stress was so great, he's sweating blood and his greatest desire, he could have prayed about anything in that hour. The greatest desire was that we would be one. Mm -hmm. He prayed for us to be one. And, and so first of all, I go, okay, wait a minute. He's our model. Paul, even Paul is not our model. Jesus is our model. 
and his greatest desire the night before the cross is that we'd be one. And then I think about, you know, when he was hanging out with the disciples, this, this story has always fascinated me since I was a kid, you know, that he says, I've got to go through Samaria. Well, being a, you know, a, 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 a Baptist boy growing up in South Carolina, I don't understand the prejudice that existed between the Jews and Samaritans. I, I've, I've been right. in the South. I've seen the racial prejudice between whites and blacks it, and, and it's bad, but it's not any, it's not, it's certainly not m more than what they had. And he's like, okay, I got to go. Th and so he, you know, he goes to there and he has, the, he meets the woman at the well. And then, uh, you know, they're like, what are you doing? And he's like, guys, open your eyes right in front of you, yeah. right before you. The fields yeah. are ripe to harvest. And yeah. and so for me personally, I've, I've never wanted to be part of just an all Anglo church. I, I, I want to be part of a church that reaches all people. Uh, yeah. Isn't that part of the heart of the discipleship process as well, is that we lay down those racial barriers too? We would hope so. Uh, it's It's complicated and complex, and it goes beyond just impulse necessarily just a, a quick anecdote for me um you know I, I grew up as a as an as an air force uh kid and so i was around a lot of different people who just by the level of melanin in their skin looked different than me yep. and we came from different cultures and and then kind of had twists and turns through different experiences in in college and even the denomination that i was ordained in they were largely white spaces and then i was part of a, a great church planning network that um, that I recovered a lot of those relationships and even had an opportunity uh, to stand up in front of a lot of people and walk through the book of Ephesians and say, hey, guys, I believe that God's heart is for every church to be a multi-ethnic church, which sounds good. Um, and then I came back off of that and was leading this church filled with white people. And, uh, and I really genuinely believed that it was the desire and the growing desire for that community of people in the Athens area to become multi-ethnic. And uh, it never really happened. What yeah. did happen is that we really grew in solidarity um for people who are different than us mm -hmm. i think the the heart of jesus for the vulnerable which biblically and by the way i love that we, we keep coming back to the scriptures here because i think it's so it's significant for what we do about here. The <laughs> but when i think through it biblically we, historically you think about the vulnerable uh in most cultures as women children uh ethnic minorities and the poor and so for me, at least growing in solidarity for that, the desire for uh, for us to be together, the desire for us, uh, for everybody to have a sense that they belong, that's very, very powerful. I don't ever want to assume that that's what we're operating out of, but I also don't want to assume that in the absence of color in the room on a Sunday morning, that that isn't the desire of the people. It's just sure. complicated. It's well, complicated. it could be just ge geographical. I mean, you know, there are places yeah. I go in rural Midwest where there's not multicultural. That's not, it what, is. I'm, that's not what I'm talking about, though. Right. Yeah. So I, I think the challenge for us uh, really comes down to an aspect of even how we think biblically and theologically. Yeah. Um, you know, watching the way here in the state of Georgia that the the very clear line in terms of how a lot of quote unquote white churches thought about uh, the Christian faith of uh, of Senator Warnock, who is a pastor um, and is a is a well versed, well accredited uh, theologian, and and how the proverbial black church saw that it's a divide, and it's we have a really hard time discerning apples and oranges together, and so I think that contributes to it, and I think there are a lot of conversations underneath that about what really guides us when we think about uh, discipleship, what are we after? Mm -hmm. And I think that there are really generational things in place, generational assumptions that I think keep us from coming closer together than we really are right now. Oh, there's so much we could do here, but I, but I, I want to allow enough time to go where I want to go here. So I'm a pastor, I'm pastoring a church. I know that my discipleship process program, next step pathway, however you describe it is not working. 
if I reach out to Matt Adair, is there something you have to make available that you can help me create a really good biblically based discipleship process? Or pathway? yeah, I think the the starting place that we have with everyone is just a, a real simple. I mean, it probably takes five minutes or less to read, which are just simply five tools that God uses for transformational discipleship. So we talk about transformational scriptures that uh, really getting clear on what the scriptures are, that it isn't a reference book. Uh, it's not yes. a theological handbook. It's not a devotional <laughs> grab bag. It's <clears throat> This is a unified story that leads to Jesus. I think we really need to think through transformational relationships. Um, most relationships in most churches don't last. We can use the language of covenant partnership, but the reality is, is that they're so weakly attached that uh, people come and go almost at ease. Uh, we need to think through transformational habits. How do we build a rhythm of life together so that we're experiencing the transformational power of the grace of God, which I've come to believe that every time we see the word, the English word grace in the scriptures, mm -hmm. It is talking about the unmerited favor of God. We don't deserve this, but what is it? Like, that got me real curious. Well, so unmerited favor. Yeah, but what is the thing? Mm -hmm. I know I don't deserve it, but what is the thing? And so so I keep walking around hearing the grace of God is the loving, empowering presence of God. When you take the loving, empowering presence of God that animates a shared life, a shared story in the scriptures and shared habits, that's how people change. And so that that's what we just, I mean, literally all I'm doing is like these tools, which I think everybody has, we all work with the scriptures. We all have relationships. There are habits of life together. We all believe in the grace of God. And so when you just begin working with tools, you're already there, but maybe, maybe tweaking them, using them in a slightly different way. Uh, I believe that it takes what God intends for your church and begins to bring it to life. So it's real, that that's just usually where we start is just trying to clarify those tools. And then we go from there. Do you like coach, coach pastors through a process? How, how does it work? Yeah, I, I mean, this initiative is so brand new for us, but I, what we're developing is really, for me, the step beyond that is a way of how do we take those tools and, and how do you just take a, a pretty simple, in less than an hour, we can walk you through those and give you a little bit uh, better way to begin thinking through what that looks like in your church. So in an hour, you could probably knock that out. But when people get beyond that and they're like, man, I really feel like we need to uh, do a really deep dive on this mm -hmm. and really tighten things up, then yeah, I do start to work with churches individually and uh, do just try to help them build a discipleship pathway from that person who drives into your parking lot the first time until they're involved in that process. Not only their life is being transformed, but they're joining you in the mission of the church. So we we try to build everything. Does it have a name? I mean, does this process have a name? Uh, like your yeah, it's transformational discipleship, and you know the easiest way to just connect there is to go to transformdiscipleship.org. dot org. Um, yeah, and yeah, and and that's just the easy place to get started. You'll get the that resource there in terms of just the the tools that uh, we use for transformation that are already in every church, and try to help people take next steps. What's your hope for all of this? For me, um, and there's so much personal narrative in this, mm -hmm. when I think about particularly the last five years or so at the church that I was at in Athens, when I think about the church that I have the opportunity to help lead in Atlanta, as I think about my three boys, I've got an 18-year-old, a 14-year-old, and an 11-year-old. And when I think 10 generations ahead for our family, when I think about the church in America, uh, um, to me, what I'm obsessed about is seeing communities of people who are growing in their capacity to love their enemies. If that was to happen, I don't know that there would be anything more significant that would happen in the church in our day. And so I'm grateful to have that kind of clarity. Sometimes I wonder if I'm missing something because it seems so clear. But whatever that looks like and however many people I get to work with, that's that's really what's driving me in this season of life um, vocationally. It really shouldn't it be that simple. 
because you said, you know, maybe I'm missing something because it seems so clear. But I mean, yeah. haven't, haven't we in the church complicated everything? Yes. And, and I want to be sensitive to how and why. Um, and I think that there are a lot of reasons. Again, I, I was ordained in a church that um, that looked at the Reformation and um, and saw all the good things. And I wonder sometimes if we uh, because, it, it, you know, we look at it and go, well, we can't love our enemies. Only Jesus can love our enemies. And so what happens, I think, sometimes, I don't think we mean for this to happen, but I think what people pick up on is, well, if I can't, and Jesus did, and if I just trust in what he did for me through his life and death on the cross, then why try? That's that's what a lot of people think. I, and I just think that's what they get into. And it doesn't help that we have people in the name of Jesus that are actively teaching and acting and working against that sense of loving your enemy. Because you know you can't do that, right, Dale? Because if we love our enemies, then we've left the door open for all kinds of crazy things to happen. And it's going to get inside our church. And then what's God going to do? I, I just go back to I think Jesus knew those things. You started up something at the beginning of today, and it's been under the current, and I'm going to go there in this particular yeah. podcast uh, because, you know, uh, one of the issues, again, I grew up in the South uh, in a traditional Baptist church, and, you know, and, and when I grew up, the homosexual issue wasn't even an issue. It, I mean, just right. if you if you lived that lifestyle, you certainly didn't tell it. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that I've, I've grown in is my ability to understand I need to love the homosexual are are the are the whatever i need to love them no matter what kind of lifestyle they live yes and for the first time in my life i've gotten to the point to where i can uh i can just love them i i, I want to I, i'm not even gonna say i can look past what they do i just can love them for being a human being i don't have to right. agree with their lifestyle i don't have to compromise my stance i don't have to become like that i can just love them and yeah. I, I wish i had gotten here a lot earlier yeah, you know I mean, I, I think just, that, it, it, I, do. I don't blame anybody but myself, but but I just was never challenged. I, I was always challenged growing up just to stay away from people who were who sure. aren't in my camp. And and I don't feel that way anymore. I think, I want, I, you know, you know I, I think it's the again, it's what I tell people there. There's something that's right about um, thinking of holiness as including my own personal and our community sexual integrity while at the same time looking at both the life of Jesus and what seems to be the impulse particularly in in the acts of the apostles as you see the holy spirit do two things one conservative and one progressive conservatively they're always wrestling with this very ancient set of documents that we call the scriptures. Mm -hmm. It is a wrestling with what we have had for a long, long time, mm -hmm. while at the same time dealing with the shocking and surprising progress of the spirit in saying, and you welcome them to. Yeah. Does that mean agreeing with everything? No. Mm -hmm. And when people say, what does it look like to love our LGBTIQ plus yeah. friends and family? Yeah. It is complicated. It is why it isn't simply a matter of proof texting. Sure. It is us growing in our capacity, which I think this is an aspect of discipleship, is have we grown in our ability to listen to the Spirit of God and respond in this moment to this person in this place? That seems to be what's happening in the book of Acts. I think that's what the Apostle Paul is working out in his letters is how do we do this? Mm -hmm. And you can see him because you can even see just the, the changing nature of his earlier letters to his later letters in different ways. He's, he's working this out. And mm -hmm. I understand that there are some churches, and I respect them if they go, look, that kind of movement of the Holy Spirit ended at the end of canonization. I get that. But I still go back to this impulse that I see in the scriptures and I go, but what if he's still continuing to invite us to be rigorously rooted using the best tools possible that we have available through the scriptures that ground us in history and tradition, which is part of my challenge. I, I, I can't get to certain places about homosexuality that 
uh, I might even want to personally sure. because they involve family and friends. Sure. While at the same time, there's a there's a progressive nature that you just you just said, I'm at a different place now than I was before. Mm -hmm. And that might be the work of the spirit, not just a culture that's getting inside my head and heart. I'm learning and growing on how to love. I'm, I'm learning and I'm learning and growing how to love people who in some ways are opposed to the way of Jesus, perhaps. I can assure you that in my own life, it's it's the work of the spirit. It's it's growth because well I think that's and, so and, much and of I, the conversation I want to make right? sure that I want to make sure that I I brought this topic up because yep. it's what I personally was working I'm not picking on this particular there's lots of topics right. we could discuss there is but I know for me personally uh, I learn I've learned how to go okay I need to look past and I, and this kind of comes back to the way we did church growing up it, I, Jesus if Jesus can save my soul. <laughs> If Jesus can take me off a road that's bound for eternal separation from him and 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 revolutionize and and transform and make a new creation out of my heart so that, that I have the hope that one day I'm going to spend eternity with him. If he can do that, yeah. he can take care of all this other stuff. And somewhere yes. from in, in my growing up, somewhere in my background, it seems that things shifted to where we were almost like you need to clean your act up before you can come to him. And we've missed the whole point of the gospel. Well, we've missed the whole point of the gospel. And, and one might wonder if we've lost our theological proper. If, if we have a, a situation where we understand um, the God of the scriptures in the way that the God of the scriptures intended. And there's lots of conversations about just different perspectives. But how do we do that? That, to me, is why it always comes back to the scriptures and being so biblically deeply rooted. And for some people, that means um, reimagining texts. I'm not talking about reimagining concepts. I mean, like looking at text through a different lens mm -hmm. and how we think about God. And it even gets down to that. So th this really is, you know, when I think about transformational discipleship, it, it really does touch everything. And it isn't, I tell people, it isn't because I'm, I'm, I'm walking in thinking everybody else everywhere has done it wrong. It's not that mm -hmm. it's just, we're looking for it's answers. looking, well, it's looking at these are the outcomes. And I think God's already given us the tools, which is why, you know, to me, I'm so in encouraged by the possibility uh, of what God might do in the local church, because this isn't about, hey, guys, like we go out to the garage and uh, of our churches and go, well, we don't have what we need. No, we do. Like they're all there. Exactly. We're already working with those tools. But sometimes <laughs> but sometimes I wonder uh, if we're supposed to be building something uh, with hammer and nail. And instead, we just uh, somebody told us to grab a saw and we wonder why it's not working. I, I just I. I just come back to the what I be, I really believe we're in the midst of, and you used the word earlier, but I believe we're in a, re a reformation in American church. What the way, way we have done ministry in the past has not worked. We have to acknowledge that, and I believe the Lord's bringing a freshness to us. And you can describe that however your camp describes it, but I just believe that we're in the midst of a, a change, and I do believe we're going to see uh, a lot of people come into the kingdom as we ourselves learn how to love people. Because you know the, this whole gospel thing is about changing your heart. Yeah. It's never been about changing your outside. You know, I used to get picked on because my hair grew down halfway on my ear and, and I got picked on by my family and, and, and it, it was never, a, it drove me away from God. It drove me away from yeah. the church. I don't want to be around yeah. those folks because they picked right. on me about how long my hair was, you know? And, yeah. Uh, we got, like I said earlier, I could talk to you for hours, but you know, the podcast is only 45 minutes. So here's yeah. what I want to do. We, we are, uh, we have uh, hundreds of small and mid-sized church leaders, uh, pastors, different folks listening today. If you were sitting down with them today, having a cup of coffee, uh, what's a one word of encouragement or hope or advice or wisdom that you would impart upon someone today if you were talking to them for the first time? Yeah, what popped into my head, you know, right before you asked that question is, and I think this is significant, is the way forward is going to be charting unknown territory. Mm -hmm. And so I think the work of adaptive leadership is important. Uh, it's the the willingness to step into an unknown world and to be able to look at yourself and look at the people around you and go, I don't have all the answers, but we're probably going to need to try some things and see what we learn um, and develop 
adaptive capacity, which involves the difficulty of leading people into the unknown. It's really hard. Yes. I think what we've all experienced in leading churches over the past few years, we know what that's like. I was just talking to somebody yesterday about, you know, here's March 2020, and we were both sharing that sitting with our leadership teams and going, I mean, we'll be back by Easter. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> yes. we'll be back in a couple of weeks. And here we were. And so I just think that that was, it, it was, I don't think it was the middle or the end. I think it was the beginning of God inviting us yes. as his church into an adaptive posture. And so uh, I'm really excited. I'll, I'll, I'll just reference uh, my, my mentor, uh, uh, Todd Bolsinger and his wonderful book, Canoeing the Mountains, which tells the story of adaptive leadership through the story of Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a book coming out uh, down the road on adaptive discipleship. And so that's that's a lot of it. So if, if in a word, it's um, adapt because you must and because you can as a leader. And so that's a lot of the work that I do too. Like I'll, I'll start working with churches on helping them think through discipleship, but inevitably I'm working with leaders who are having to learn how to operate, not as technicians or as experts, but as adaptive guides. And so that's my invitation to, to church leaders is lead the learning. Your church does not need you to be the all-knowing wizard because you're not. And we're in a day in which there are none. Um, right. It is we're all just leading the learning. And so that's the opportunity that I get to do in the church that I'm a part of. It's the opportunity that I get to do with the people that I'm coaching and the churches I consult with, just leading the learning and trusting that the Spirit's going to get us where he wants to go. As a kid growing up, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible in Psalm 119 says, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. In my book, I talk about that because, you know, uh, in our society, we have flashlights and all this stuff, but all they have were lanterns. Right. And, and when you have a lantern, it, it puts out a 360 degree, but it's not far. So, right. so here's this, you take a step and you see, you yes. take a step and sometimes you go, oh, wait a minute, there's a cliff there, or, you know, there's a rattlesnake there. It, yeah. it, it doesn't show you, and we're, it seems like in America, we're always like trying to figure out, you know, how to take, you know, two mile steps at a time. And so right. uh, I, I think all of us just need to take a deep breath and then exhale and then just relax and let's let the Lord guide us. And I hope that our listeners will reach out to you, especially mm -hmm. if they want to learn how to, to just do a, a more thorough job of, of discipleship. Uh, I'll have all the contact information in the show notes. And and thank you so much for just taking a chance mm -hmm. on being on here with me. I, I uh, I'm so thrilled with what you're doing and with your heart and with your understanding. And uh, I hope we can stay in touch in, in the days ahead uh, just to, you know, to impact the church together. Yeah, I love that. And I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing as someone who pastored a small to mid-sized church for 17 years. What y'all are doing is a gift. So thank you. And thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to the 95 podcast. We look forward to sharing another episode with you next week. In the meantime, visit our website at 95network.org. The website is loaded with great resources created for small and mid-sized church leaders. Until next time, have a great week.